Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to Pyragogy in Action 14. We're looking at collaborative learning environments today, and we're joined by Carl and Steve. Uh, I'll introduce them briefly. Uh, you can see them there up on screen. Uh, Charlotte uh, is behind the scenes. Charlotte Thurst is behind the scenes making this, this all happen. So Carl Haka Reinen has been an instructor at the Worcester Institute for Senior Education, which is otherwise known as WISE, for more than a decade, teaching courses on technology, history, law, and the social sciences. He retired from a long career in high tech and journalism, and his grandchildren still ask him for help with their tech gadgets. So I'll be very interested to learn about WISE. I, Hadn't ever heard of it uh, before, uh, before I met Carl. And in fact, I hadn't heard of it before. Carl's been joining some of our conversations, but I didn't know the formal name of your uh, organization till now. Our other guest is Steve Yost, who started and leads the Lexington Online Course Collective, or LexOC, a diverse group of people who have who agree upon and take online courses together, meeting weekly for discussions. LexOC have been active since early 2019. The evolving group has taken courses ranging from Shakespeare to molecular biology. And Steve offers help to propagate this cooperative learning model to others. He's a software engineer, musician, rower, and general omnivore of life. So there we go. These are our guests. Uh, I think with that clue about uh, rower, I can get a guess about maybe about how Charlotte met you, Steve. Um, uh, would either of you like to <clears throat> say a little bit about um, your experiences of the Pyragogy project as well. So this is also for anyone who happens to be joining at episode 14, can serve as a brief introduction to Pyragogy from some of the newer members of our community. Sure. I can actually start um, because I think I was first in line to meet Charlotte of, of Carl and I. And um, the way that came about is after having worked through my Lexington Online Collective for a few years, I decided I wanted to be able to share this model since it was so successful with, with other people. So I put together this website called onlinecoursecollective.org. And, uh, and then, you know, the social platform Mastodon was just coming uh, into popularity. I joined that and I saw a post by Howard Rheingold um, about work that he had just done that sounded just really lit up all the, uh, lit my light bulb. And so I contacted Howard. He told me you should talk to the Piragogy people, Piragogy people. And uh, so immediately I was connected with Charlotte. And uh, and then it was a coincidence that she's also a rower, just extra icing on the cake. Okay. And it was through that that I think, Carl, that I uh, was acquainted with with your work at Wise. And so you can take it from there. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Steve. And thanks, Joe. Yes. Um, in parallel, you know, so Steve had reached out. We've been a member of a, um, a an email uh, discussion list for about 25 years, and our careers overlapped at a software company. We uh, we so, so we get to talking about our projects, and in parallel, I'd been looking at different ways of teaching. Uh, my focus is on teaching seniors, so the Piragogy project seem to have some very good models. And uh, one of the contributors to version three of the, of the manual, uh, Brian Alexander, is a, uh, a friend and someone I've, I've known uh, through his work for, for quite a few years. So it's been a, uh, you know, an engaging uh, experience to try to understand how we organize these peer groups and looking at the ways in which learning and retirement groups or uh, lifelong learning uh, organizations have been doing similar things. WISE has been in operation for 30 years. Uh, but, uh, programs such as learning and retirement started in the early 1960s. So these are, these are familiar models that keep uh, reinventing themselves from time to time. Very cool. Yeah, I think that they've already hinted both of you now collectively, collaboratively, about how and why the Piragogy project exists. So it exists partly for exchanges like this one and, and to be a place to bring some of those conversations which might be happening on other mailing lists. I'd be interested uh, to, to know that mailing list. Some other folks might want to uh, follow up there as well. So yeah, uh, Charlotte, if you could flip us ahead. Uh, we got a 
quick uh, profile images of uh, these folks. I've never heard of assumption wise as well, but I'm guessing this is also reference to the wise uh, project that we discussed before. Um, so yeah, so um, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, usually we do three topics. Today we have four topics exceptionally, so there's a lot to cover. Um, we're just about five minutes in. So um, online course collectives, what are they? And uh, maybe we go to Steve first, we could start a conversation. What are your top tips for starting your own online course collective? Right, right. Yeah, so I'll first describe what it is. And, and I use the, uh, you know, the, what are they in hopes of propagating it. And it's real, I've already gotten some traction elsewhere. Um, the, the way I, it uh, got started was I was um, about to go into semi-retirement and knowing that I, I love learning and I love collaborating with other people, that's what I would miss at work. Um, I thought I love to take online courses. I, as I mentioned in my sort of bio, I, I'm an omnivore of uh, knowledge and everything else. And um, I thought, well, I can take some courses, but that's lonely. So uh, I live in Lexington, which is kind of a, there's a lot of technical kind of people in town, blue uh, white, white collar kind of town, you might say. And that it had a mailing list. And so I posted a message to this mailing list. Say, hey, anyone interested in taking a course together? Let's just decide what it will be. And uh, we can get together at the library or somewhere once a week. And I got good response. And so fast forward through all of the minutia of getting that all done. That's the nuts and bolts that I could talk about at length. Um, we took our first course. It was a success. And, um, and I reached out again to a larger audience, including a Facebook audience. Uh, we had sort of a second round and got into more courses that were very um, discussion oriented courses. And so um, you can see on the, on the site, onlinecoursecollective.org, I've uh, sort of a curated set of courses that we've taken that are really good for discussion. So each course lasts, uh, you know, we take a course on like Coursera or um, MITx or um, at, at your local library might be available Canopy's um, for free. All these are free, by the way. Uh, Canopy's uh, great courses. So many different media. So we choose one of these courses collectively, kind of come to a consensus about it, and then we dive in and we meet once a week in person. So that's the gist of, of what it is. And um, the characteristic of our particular group is that you know we're all kind of omnivores, like I said. Um, we're open to all kinds of courses and uh, the diversity of courses we've taken is, is really good. Also the diversity of people in our group is, is really rich. And I think that makes for a good, uh, a good discussion group, a good on, ongoing you know, sharing interests. And it's good to have different viewpoints uh, in any kind of creative effort. Um, and it's interesting that the site, onlinecoursecollective.org, is focused right now on all these nuts and bolts, like how to find a meeting room and what, what's your next step. And I was reflecting, I really need to add a lot more to the site that talks about how a group evolves and how the leadership, in my role in this case, uh, evolves as you uh, first establish kind of, okay, what are the ground rules and working relationship, just sort of ca casually uh, institute this sort of social uh, aspect to it. And then as the group evolves to be kind of people trust each other and know how to interact and so on with all this diversity, my role evolved to be more of a moderator. Um, so not so much guiding through the entire course of the week, um, but just fostering the, the conversations and keeping it on track. So it's interesting to think about that over time. Cool. Well, maybe maybe uh, we need to have a, a Piragaji pattern, uh, write it up as a pattern, a nice succinct summary of, you know, the evolving yeah. role, uh, perhaps is important. But yeah, going from spearheading something because you wanted to keep learning to, wow, suddenly you're managing a, a, a organization of a lot of other people with similar interests sounds like an exciting trajectory. Um, Carl, do you have anything you'd like to jump in to add to that discussion? Sure. Do you do online? Do you do online course collectives or is this? Uh, uh, they are. <laughs> A bit more uh, structured than uh, Steve's experience. We've been uh, in business, as I said, for about 30 years and uh, started off with a, a group of retired social workers who wanted to continue learning. And now we have on a scale of 300 members. It's a paid membership organization. 
and we have a couple of paid staffers who assist with registration and uh, coordination of schedules and so on, uh, as well as volunteers who select courses and instructors and evaluate those instructors. And our classes are five week, 90 minute sessions. They are typically lecture discussion with uh, some smaller groups, maybe more conversational. We have one 95 year old uh, philosophy professor who teaches with a Socratic method. And so he's got some very uh, precise ways of eliciting group engagement. We also have people who are teaching your know, class classes with more than a hundred people. And there were uh, questions and comments uh, that uh, you know jam the jam the meeting. So you know, in between that, um, I have my courses. I just finished teaching a course on wrongology, the study of being wrong, mm -hmm. and uh, we'll be teaching a course in the fall on the the Luddites, the history of the Luddites in the early 19th century and coming up to the uh, modern day uh, colloquial version of Luddites. We're not smashing machines, but we're uh, actively resisting the, the power of mechanization over our, over our lives. And so the, the courses, as I say, are a bit more formal than what uh, Steve has talked about. We do online courses. We were forced into that by COVID, and we're finding that lots of people, particularly who live outside of the Worcester area, I, I should have mentioned earlier, we're based at Assumption University in Worcester, and we have um, you know lots of people in the Worcester area. But also, like now, I'm I'm at our summer place, which is you know a good distance from Worcester. And um, yet I'm able to participate, do teach, as well as take courses. Cool. Yeah, I, was, I saw the slide that said 30 years ago, uh, 30 years of peer learning. That's certainly a good track record, uh, more so than we've had in the Pyragogy project, although some of our uh, members have been peer learning uh, in different ways. But to, to announce 30 years of peer learning is quite exciting and see that written down. I typed that into Google and uh, 30 years ago was uh, Tuesday, May 11th, 1993. The internet was about to get pretty big right back then, but it sounds like you moved online, uh, uh, fully online. I, I should add, I was working at digital at the time and we got uh, access to the um, it was a Mosaic browser, I think it was. And you know, it was probably one of the very few times when I made a prediction that came true. The first time that I saw it, and it was very small scale, I said, this is going to be big. This is going to be really big. And I got it right. <laughs> cool. uh, I see you also uh, on the slide, it talks about an interest group in AI in the Supreme Court. Right. That's, a, that's a very up-to-date topic. Could you tell a little bit about that? Uh, sure. Uh, we've been doing a Supreme Court discussion group. We have a retired attorney who leads those discussions. And we look at uh, cases before the court uh, you know, throughout the court's term. So it starts in October and finishes at the end of June. Uh, the AI discussion special interest group is going to be starting this fall. We've got a, a spotlight lecture or, or discussion coming up in a couple of weeks where we will be able to talk about things. So the, one of the aspects of it, uh, there are three of us will be speaking. One will be speaking on the ethics of AI, uh, another will be speaking on some concerns and he calls it, you know, the devil is in the details. And when I heard, heard his title, I said, well, I've got to go back to uh, Mies van der Rohe, who said, God is in the details. And so we're going to be fo uh, focusing on three aspects of AI as a kickoff to the special interest group that will be uh, continuing into the next year with a particular focus on how AI is going to be affecting uh, seniors, uh, AI in uh, healthcare, AI in uh, socialization, AI in uh, education, and how they regard it in preparation for their conversations with their grandchildren, uh, so that they're not so afraid and not so bewildered when the grandkids are talking about using ChatGPT to summarize a paper that they've just written. It sounds exciting. I, I'm curious to know, uh, to both of you, if I could get involved in some of these conversations and how I could get involved. Uh, 
or how anyone could get involved if they were you know living overseas or living in a different part of the country um but maybe we can fold that into a discussion of our next uh point charlotte if you could if you could move us ahead to that uh uh, slide topic three is challenges for maintaining groups, whether the groups are free or paid, the need for scheduled and ad hoc discussions uh, outside, the need for scheduled and ad hoc discussions outside of uh, formal meeting. We also have a question coming in, best practices for maintaining interest and do people drop out? So uh, over 30 years, I could imagine people have come and gone from WISE. Uh, you have some um, instructors, the uh, senior instructors instructing seniors sounds cool, but do you, do you work with others who are uh, of in younger generations? That's one first question. Uh, I want to so, ask. so we don't uh, we don't check IDs. Uh, people of any age can join, and there are people mm. who, uh, on occasion, uh, who are uh, perhaps uh, you know, parents who are stay at home and they want to do something during the day while the kids are in school. They'll uh, they can join. Uh, we've had just a few of those other similar organizations have been more proactive in that space uh, and have been able to engage uh, younger people. I have had students from Assumption University come to my classes to present their projects. So I've worked with a history professor a couple of times where uh, the topic that I was teaching related to research that these students were doing in the course of their uh, studies. And so they would come and present their material on uh, advertising in colonial America or um, you know, studies of advertisements in newspapers uh, in, the, um, you know, in the colonial era. So we've had some opportunities for uh, cross-generational discussions as well as, uh, of course, you know, education among seniors and you know invariably we there's an attrition rate because uh, of our population which you know, people do get old and they they be older and they become uh, unable to participate uh, but nobody gets to play the I'm too old card with me I've had people in their 90s uh, attend classes uh, ask good questions about the technology as well as about how um, you know how to do other stuff. So there's there's no uh, upper age limit, and uh, we try as often as possible to bring in younger people. So this this brings to because you do a lot of content production, whereas uh, it sounds like your organization anyway does a lot of content production and bringing in guest speakers or people who can present things. Whereas Steve, it sounds to me as though primarily your organization has grown up around the fact, which is an interesting fact, that there's so many other people out there doing great content production. Why don't we spend some time learning about it? And we'll produce maybe some para content, which is the discussions, and, and we might. So, so tell a little bit. Uh, but then you are also talking, Steve, that you yourself felt motivated to create sort of an instruction manual, how others can do this. And I, we, I know at least one person in the Pedagogy Project who was inspired by your work, uh, Fabio, this is, and he said, I'm going to go try it. So he went, he went off and tried it. So you've got this great kind of experimental process that pretty much anyone anywhere in the world, Fabio's in Brazil, can, can replicate um, and, you know, report also on what works for them. So it sounds like you are creating some content. Is that, is that, uh, is that goal? Yeah, kind of focused on, I'd is, say is your I, I could start by sort of contrasting with the, the, the WISE model. Um, and also getting back to your question, what would it take if, uh, if you wanted to participate? And mm -hmm. I'll, I'll say that one thing about what, what we have in the Lexington group, uh, and given that it has a name Lexington, is that it, it, it's really important. It certainly was a key factor when we started to meet in person uh, mm -hmm. because the kinds of discussions, I mean, we're all used to Zoom meetings like, uh, and other online meetings like this. And, and of course, uh, Rem reminiscing mostly <laughs> about great uh, gatherings in person. Mm -hmm. um, and so given that the in, in-person component is, is really important, even though we're online mostly now, we still get together for beers or something now and then, uh, especially when it's time to choose the next course, when you really want a feel of the room and, you know, a good sense of people's, uh, uh, even just the, minute uh, facial expressions, you know, are they, mm -hmm. are you on board with this? That kind of thing. 
so so that part of it is important now get to get to your question that you you just asked about creating content um that's i would call that sort of meta content like it's like this this model has worked for us this pattern you might say i really like mm -hmm. the pattern language kind of uh, uh language um since it's worked for us i'd like to see if we could replicate this model i don't have any personal interest in it but it's worked so well and it's so much fun for us uh, I mm -hmm. want to empower others to do this. And it was really fantastic that uh, having gotten involved in the Piragaji meetings uh, that Fabio took it up. And it's an interesting um, segue a little bit to think about the different kinds of this model. There are flavors of it. So the current one we have in Lexington is group of omnivores. They're there for the long run, looking forward to the next course as soon as the one course is finished. Um, there's a, there's another perfectly valid model, uh, and useful model for which this works, which is a group of professionals, which is what Fabio did. Uh, he and a group of teachers took a course, uh, called, I believe it was called the bilingual mind, um, and they're English, they're, they're language teachers. And, um, and so they found this course online and met, I believe it was, uh, once a week. Uh, to discuss what they agreed to cover for that week. And it's just a good way of motivating uh, yourselves collectively to do the, do the work. So the more technical or, um, and in fact, that's how we started just to go back a bit. I started the Lexington online collective and I put up all of these possible courses from history to art, to machine learning. <laughs> and this group of people that came together who had never met at the library chose to do the hardest and the longest course, which is a course on machine learning uh, that went probably th three months. And by the time we were finished, uh, we went from seven people down to three people because just normal attrition, it's hard work. <laughs> and so the courses, as I mentioned, we do now are uh, more geared towards social interaction, where I imagine that Fabio's was really about doing the work, right? Mm. Um, I'll mention one other uh, variant of this model, which I, uh, I called paragogy, um, okay. because uh, along the course of doing these courses, there was one course like a heavy duty statistics course I wanted to take, and I knew it was not going to be good for our group. And so I just posted to the group, anybody want to take this with me? It's just, we're just going to be doing the homework. And one person responded, that's exactly what I wanted to take. And so she and I met at the library. And we came up with this model where we agreed that each week, one of us would act as the professor. Uh, we've both studied the work, but one of us had to sort of teach the course. Um, and of course, you, you, we all know that having to teach something is the best way to learn mm -hmm. it very thoroughly. So that was another variant of, uh, of, of this collective model that worked really well, just one-on-one. -on -one. Um, That's very if, cool. If I could just toss it. So one of the things that I've just started, I'll say, playing with, uh, Khan Academy, of course, has you know, courses primarily geared to uh, high school and younger ages. Uh, Sal Khan has just released a tutor, uh, an AI-enabled tutor that uh, is integrated into Khan Academy to help students understand you know, how you know, where they went wrong in a particular module. I just got access to it. And so I'm uh, picking up on a statistics course that I started a couple of years ago and didn't finish, but it was very helpful in, you know, very specifically showing me uh, without giving me the answer, showing me where my answer was wrong and uh, working as a one-on-one -on -one tutor. And mm -hmm. this is his model of being able to have a scalable system so that you get one-on-one -on -one tutors for millions of students. And mm -hmm. I think this, uh, so just as a, as a segue on statistics, I mean, this oh, is just uh, you know, basic statistics, not, nothing uh, at the scale yeah. that what Steve yeah. was talking that's, about. That's pretty exciting, pretty exciting. I mean, it's very current because I see Khan Academy posted this news May 1. So consider yeah. yourself to be part of cutting edge. I had never heard of that, although I'd been following. Yeah, it's interesting Khan along Academy. those lines is that uh, Andrew Ng, who's a, a, who's a star in the world of machine learning, mm -hmm. uh, actually founded Coursera, you know, with this ah. platform for which, for, through which we take a lot of these courses. And I saw a talk by him in which he explained that they are 
even in, even in the early days, very carefully tracked students' progress and when they dropped off and and they so they would they would adjust do A/B tests and kind of things on on the quizzes to try to keep people engaged. Didn't want to make the quiz too hard, but not too easy. Uh, and so that's been a, a aspect of these, at least the two that we've talked about, of these platforms is to try to ensure that people succeed to get through a course. So, so um, I'd like to do a number of things simultaneously. One is, uh, Charlotte, if we could move on to topic four. I have that up on the screen. The next one is, uh, if you're willing to jump into the discussion, Charlotte, I wanted to bring you into the discussion about uh, topic-oriented discussions because you're also running, um, you know, and have been oh, for a while helping run IPNI, the uh, New England uh, Independent Publishers Organization. So that's okay. a, an interest group uh, about book discussions about publishing books rather than reading books. But here's here's a number of uh, topics around special interest groups, book discussion, writing groups, special events, travel. Yeah. Um, so I wondered if you had any comments or questions for Carl and yeah. Steve uh, based on your experiences with IPNI or other other organizations. Yeah, we well, I've been at, at, on the board and, and involved in, in IPNE, uh, Independent Publishers of New England, for since oh, gosh, 2008, I think. But it's been, you know, a pretty <clears throat> uh, rough... I, there hasn't been a lot of progress in just sort of gelling a, you know, truly d engaged dynamic community of people. Um, but there's been some success. And I think one of the things that we've done in recent years, <clears throat> so we have six states, right? New England states with varying numbers of members in each one, but we decided to start regional groups and those have been kind of sputtering along since, you know, for the last 10 years, maybe. Um, but, but Zoom has, or, you know, online um, connections have really enhanced that. And we, I think the major thing is, is to do it regularly. So, you know, I finally got, you know, a regular schedule for the Kinetic, and we started a Connecticut group. The Vermont group is really thriving and the Metro Boston group, but we have other states that, you know, other regions that we could develop. But I think those two things, like, I don't know, people just, for this wide area, it's, it's hard to, to, to kind of form a common, bond or you know and so we're I, starting with the regional things mm -hmm. uh trying to um, maintain mm -hmm. attention you know, before the show we were talking about mm -hmm. you know my definition of luxury is being able to do one thing at a time and we have so many things pulling at us mm -hmm. and trying to ensure that members of these learning groups can uh, you know to use phrase, Steve's phrase you know, can succeed. Part of it is to keep them engaged, and part and by that I also mean keep you know keep me engaged because yeah. you know I will I've got the oh oh squirrel kind of response to so <laughs> many different cool things, and it disrupts my ability to participate in any one thing really well. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I would and kind of keep an eye add, out for sorry, yeah, just sorry for what is, you know, what people's like little thing is, you know, and then try and address that once in a while, you know. Yeah, I don't know if that makes sense. You might find an idea that works really well in one context for a while, but doesn't doesn't work mm -hmm. very well in another context, or or indeed does work in another context again for a while. So how do you how do you keep things lively and moving? Uh, this this uh, we're going to have to leave, keep this one moving. Um, Charlotte, mm -hmm. if you could move to our closing uh, slides, just talk a little bit about how we like to close out these conversations. So yeah, that is a, a comment on all the people who've contributed to making this possible. Thank you everybody for uh, participating in the podcast and in the Pyragogy project as 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 well. And on the very next slide. Uh, there's some questions. Uh, what did we expect to learn or make together? What happened? Uh, what are some different perspectives on what happened? Uh, what did we learn and what should we change going forward? And I very much hope our guests will be able to stick around. We've got one more slide. Uh, the after discussion will take place on meet.jit.c slash 
And there's other ways for you to get involved with the Piragaji project at piragaji.org. So have a look at that if you're interested. There's loads of ways to find us online. Uh, but the discussion, and I can think of a few interesting next steps I'd like to discuss with uh, guests, will be taking place on that link in a few minutes. So uh, for those who can stick around, I'll see you there. Um, thanks so much uh, to Carl and Steve. Thank you, Charlotte, for making Thank this you. happen. And Thank we'll call you. it around. Thank you very much. All right. See you on Jitsi.